Great to have you with us. Now, scores of people are accusing the Ghana National Fire Service of neglect in this year's recruitment process, even though they have met every requirement. Some of them picketing, as the Fire Academy and Training School say, they were called after the final medical stage only to be turned away on their arrival for recruitment. The process, which ended days ago, has left many of them stranded. They share their frustrations with Joy News. We bought forms. We came for screening. And after the screening, they sent us a message to come for medicals. And we know that in any training institution, immediately you are being asked to go for your medicals. It means you have been picked. So after the medicals, they've um, asked some people to come. Some have come from Kumate, Sakrade, BA, and they are here since last week Sunday. Last week Sunday, on Saturday, they told us we should wait this morning. They are going to uh, call some names and then select. This morning we came, they asked us we should leave here. They don't have anything to do with here. All they are doing is not good at all. Because since last week, some of us are here. They are not doing anything. We can even hear they'll call people on the phone that they should go about their attempts and come. And they will see them, as, uh, what was that, three days today. I was here, they called some guy on the phone that they should go about attempts. And immediately she came, no, they said we should go to the training gang, which is not fair. We bought a form, go to the medicals. Even though that we are not ready, they should tell us something about that we should go. I bought all my items. You could see I'm holding my items, which is not good. Some are above ages. They call them from the house to come. Meanwhile, I bought the forms. For how long have you been waiting out here? About, about last week Sunday, when I came here. And you haven't had any response? Nothing, no, nothing, no. nothing at all, nothing but nothing. Some of us, they even changed our names. I'm from North Town, and then with 20 season, we started this and we did everything. Then no message to tell you that this is your problem, that's why we are not picking you. And then this year to the same thing, we passed through medical and everything. And they said if you are able to pass through medical, you are qualified for everything. Right, so those are the concerns of some applicants uh, to the fire service. Now, joining me on the line now is uh, the public relations officer of the Ghana National Fire Service, uh, James Okwatin. Thank you very much for joining us. Are you aware of these concerns and the situation at the fire academy? Um, good afternoon to your viewers. Mm. Um, I am totally surprised that some people will still be at the fire academy and training school claiming that they've been invited for training. Because officially the training ended last Saturday. The last batch left the academy Saturday and probably those from long distances yesterday. So I'm surprised that any group of people will be there and will be claiming that they've been invited. I, I wonder how they were invited. Because we also know that there are people who are claiming to be officials of Ghana National Fire Service, who are extorting money and telling these people that we can help you. I don't know if these are victims of such, uh, such a scam or... Officially, the recruitment is over. Have you notified the applicants who are gathered at the Fire Academy now that you know, the recruitment is over and if they haven't been contacted, it means they've not been selected? That's why I, I, I earlier said that I'm even surprised that any people will be there claiming that they've been called. Because those who are called, they have come and they have ended their training. So I don't know who called them or who, who sent them messages. I heard some of them saying that they've gone through medical and it is automatic, that when you go through medical, it means you've been employed. And that is an erroneous impression. Have you communicated because, this to yeah. them? Because when you go through the medical, you could feel the medical. So you cannot claim that you went to medical, so from there you have carried your things because you heard some people have been called. Most of them are acting on the fact that their friend has, has been called. So they also feel that they have a right there. But we fundamentally... Of those who have been invited, once you get to the gate, you, you check from the book. If you are there, you, if your name is there, you admitted. Then you sign that you have actually reported. And that is how they come in. If your name is not in the book, you will not be allowed to enter because those who are invited are those, is that master list. 
those who are invited, it is the same names that appear in the hard copy of the book that is the training school. Mr. Kwasing, have you spoken to these persons who have been camping as the Fire Academy for days? Well, I, 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 I have just been made aware because I, <laughs> I didn't even know somebody was on until the producer called me. Has the service officially that spoken to these people? Over. Has the service officially addressed these people? Well, I cannot, I cannot say for sure because I'm not in the office even at the moment. Right. Uh, would you say that they will be right or the, their comments that this is not fair will be in order, considering the fact that we do not know if they've been addressed since they came here. We do not know on which authority they came here in the first place and they've been left there. And I, nobody would invite them officially because the exercise is over. I'm saying it again that nobody will officially invite them. It's interesting that you mentioned the point this, that Mr. Some, mm. some people may have been called by people who are not officials of the service, but they have gotten money from these people and given them assurances. But officially, we will not call anybody when we know there is no training going on. Now, it's interesting you mentioned this because this will not be the first time that this is happening with the security service. We found that with the police, some people were fraudulently uh, floating police forms and telling people to gather at um, various recruitment centers for the Ghana Police Service. Now, since you know this, that some people are illegally informing people that they have been selected, would you take the steps to report to the police, have these investigated so these people are brought to book? We will want to um, engage these people and actually ask them who invited them. But you then haven't spoken to them. Names, you didn't even know they were have there. To follow up. Otherwise, we, we, we started this week knowing that we have finished the exercise, so we are not expecting anybody at the training school. I have said that earlier. Thank you, James Quarting. He's public relations officer for the Ghana National Fire Service. Now, rector for the Ghana Institute of Journalism, Professor Kwamina Kwansa Edu, says a student's refusal to pay their fees after examinations compelled school authorities to reinforce an already existing regulation on fee paying. The regulation, according to the rector, bars students who have not paid 80% or 60% of their fees from taking the semester exams. Some students over the weekend were barred from writing the exams, causing them to picket at the school to show their displeasure. Professor Kwansa Edu says a management meeting today is expected to decide the fate of those who missed out on Sunday's exam. He spoke to Joy News' Maxwell Agbagba. There are people who have their certificates lying around. Mm. There are students who wrote an undertaking last semester. Not last year, just last semester who are still students here, who wrote an undertaking and said, we will pay, and some have gone, who did not pay. So it is very true. I, I, I heard from one of um, my colleagues here that there was a student who was saying that he's paid his fees, he's paid his fees, but the system is not allowing him to register. And then we were quite, the, the, this accounts person was quite curious. He wanted to find out what the real issue was. So they took his payment thing, went into the system to check what had happened. This student, Owes fees from level 200. This is a level 400 student. He owes fees from level 200. He owes fees from level, level 300. And then he's going to pay monies, thinking this is fees for level 400. So the system, and rightly so, has allocated those sums to the fees that he owes. So tech, even though he thinks he has paid, no, he hasn't. Because he's only made good his debt. So there are a lot of them in the system like that. Meanwhile, we have to run the place. We have to make arrangements for exam booklets. We have to pay invigilators. We have to pay um, our bills, electricity, everything. All of that comes from what government calls academic facility use of fees. If they don't pay, or after they have done this, if they go and they don't pay, of what use is the certificate to us? Okay. We need those monies to run the place. Now, Maxwell also reports security has been beefed up on campus. 
all is calm. Um, there's heavy police presence, as I already mentioned. Um, the police vehicle um, positioned here. A lot of police officers heavily armed, making sure that a conducive atmosphere is created for the students to um, write the exams. Um, we are told that management will be making a decision, and they are they are going into a meeting actually, and will be deciding the fate of the um, other students who are unable to write the um, examinations yesterday. I've paid my fees and I'm, I'm supposed to use that facility there. The fees on our, on our uh, admission letter is that the fees is for facility user fee. Which one is the facility? Is it not the school? Is it not the things there? Are you talking about academic facility user fees? academic and then facility user fee. And when we are talking about the facilities, we are talking about the lecture halls. Fine, I can use the lecture hall, but I can use the desks outside there at the four courts. I can use the library. Okay. I can go to the cafeteria. Are you writing your exams today? I'm not writing an exam today. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're not writing your exams today, uh, so that's why they said they won't allow you to enter because you're not writing your Because I'm, I'm not having my ID card with me. I can't go around with my ID card. Fine, let's say I come with my ID card. Something happens, it, it falls down. Says they have a paper. How do I come and write a paper? Mm. It is the same people who come who tell me that I shouldn't write my paper because I don't have my ID card with me. Mm. But you would agree that um, uh, the situation here escalated yesterday, and management is doing everything possible to create a conducive atmosphere for your colleagues to write their exams. So if you're here without an ID card, and the security officers are saying they're not allowed you to enter, I mean you should understand. See, this listen. Yeah. I I want I, those police officers. Yes, you are, you, are, you are supposed to enforce the law. Mm. You, are so, you are supposed to be for the citizenry. Mm. I want them to come and beat me up. Mm. I mean, that's what they know, they know how to do. They, what they know is that go around, beat people up. Just come and beat me up. The rights to information bill will not be passed in this sitting of parliament. That's according to a member of the Communications Committee of Parliament, Andrew Kofi Ejafamesa. You will recall that members of the coalition pushing for the passage of the bill stormed Parliament on Friday um, to, as it were, pile pressure on the House to pass the bill. Minority Leader Harun Idris was assured that the long-awaited awaited, um, right to information bill will be passed before the year ends. But speaking on the AM show earlier Monday, member of the Communication Committee, Andrew Ejapa Mesa, said the bill will not be passed before the House rises. It's looking very tight. <laughs> yes, because... It's looking what? Very tight. Meaning what? That... It's looking is like we are difficult. not going to be able to do it. Deliberately? It's not deliberate. It's just the timing. It's just not practicable. Of course, if we are asked to sit 18 hour days, we possibly could do it. But as to whether we will come out passing a good law, that will be the aspirations of the people is another matter. Uh, I, I think that the commitment from both His Excellency and leadership of parliament has been demonstrated. Time really has been our challenge. Per your experiences, you think that it would be after reset next year there? I, I, I think that the, the, the most practicable time we are looking at is probably when we come back uh, during the first meeting of the third session of, of parliament. Still I have on Joy News today with me, Daniel Daz. is still up ahead, founder of National Democratic Congress, Jerry John Rawlins asks NDC executives to reconsider the filing fees for presidential hopefuls following a petition by some aspirants. But the Functional Executive Committee of the party says it will meet on Tuesday over concerns raised. That certain actions or... We will take into consideration the appeal of the disgruntled presidential aspirants and they appeal by no less a person than the founder and former president of Ghana, former president Jerry John Rawlings. And All that and more coming up. Stay with us. Having joined you today, now former president and founder of the NDC, Jerry John Rawlings, has asked the party's National Executive Committee to take a second look at the filing fee for flag bearer hopefuls. A statement from his office issued after a meeting with newly elected uh, party executives stated, quote, certain actions or decisions could 
either be a reflection of the circumstances of the NDC's birth or mark a departure from where we are coming from as a party. End quote. Here are excerpts of that statement. Former President Jerry Rollins expressed concern about the whopping increase in the filing fee for the presidential primaries of the National Democratic Congress and called on the party's National Executive Committee to take a second look at the decision. The founder of the NDC cautioned that certain actions or decisions could either be a reflection of the circumstances of the NDC's birth or, quote, mark a departure from where we are coming from as a party. He also said, and I quote, I doubt if any one of us who has served with integrity, relying on our salaries, can raise these filing fees unless we engage in some unethical behavior while in office, unless we abuse or misuse our positions during our tenure. The former president said, with the aspirants having barely two weeks to raise the amount, the perception may be created that the party is being handed over to the highest bidder. The party founder advised the National Executive Committee to review its decision and find alternatives to address the legitimate concern of raising funds to finance the presidential elections. The founder commended the newly elected party officers for their initiative and took them through a roller coaster journey of accomplishments and betrayals that define the current state of the party, he urged them to imbibe the superior values of probity, accountability, and social justice, which used to set the NDC apart from all other parties. Whilst they all ponder on the way forward, he wished the newly elected party officers well in their quest to rebuild a formidable party. Now, all the flag bearer hopefuls, with the exception of former President Mahama, have petitioned the party's Council of Elders to reduce the amount. The nine aspirants proposed that fees for collection of forms be pegged at 5,000 CDs instead of 20,000, whilst filing fees be 100,000 CDs instead of 400,000. National Communications Officer of the NDC, Sami Jemfi, says the founder's concerns will be addressed in a functional executive committee meeting Tuesday. Well, I, I can confirm to you that the national chairman and leader of the NDC has given a clear indication that in line with the democratic tenets underlining you know, our activities as a party, uh, we will take into consideration the appeal of the disgruntled presidential aspirants and the appeal by no less a person than the founder and former president of Ghana, former President Jerry John Rawlings. And so uh, tomorrow, FEC is going to meet. Uh, I know that NEC may be reconvened by the party to take a second look at our nomination fees, but I would not like to engage in any conjecture or speculations as to whether or not the fee, as approved by NEC, is going to be reduced or not. But I can tell you that we will take a second look at that. That is something that the chairman and leader of the party has clearly indicated. But how does this happen when you have opened um, nominations and that's supposed to happen for 48 hours? The presidential hopefuls are also appealing that you reduce the cost of the nomination from some 20,000 to 5,000. Like I said, the NDC is a democratic institution and we will look at the appeal. We will look at it. Uh, the national chairman has given that clear indication. The nomination will start today as, as, uh, as scheduled. You now the process has not been stayed. But that process is not sacrosanct. NEC is a master of his own rules. And I believe that um, it wouldn't spoil anything. At the end of the day, NEC is re going to reconsider his decision. And should there be a change, I'm sure that that can be rectified. Well, one of the 96 MPs supporting the candidature of former President Mahama says the group has been able to raise more than the amount needed. A 96 in number, MPs for JM. And um, on Saturday, we decided to mobilize resources and pay 1,000 cities each. So 96 of us would have been 96,000 cities. But we said let's extend it beyond our circles and invite friends, sympathizers, and well-wishers who might want to chip in something. Within the party? Within, well, within the party. Like. Is that why we've seen a viral laser has swelled over 118 or so? I haven't seen the lists, but and we have not put out the lists largely because of privacy issues. 
Now, I'm sure there are civil servants who may want to chip in something. Uh, looking at the nature of the MPP and the, the fact that they have a tendency, they have a proclivity to victimize persons who are seen as NDC. We don't want anybody to suffer the consequences of chipping in something for John Muhammad's uh, return. And if you look at the groundswell of support that this has generated in less than 24 hours, we maxed, you know, um, uh, we, we were able to raise more than the 420,000. How cities. much have you raised so far? I haven't checked the latest figures yet. But, but it could run it's, into? It's, I'm, I'm sure it's about 600,000 cities. Now, Ghana, for the second time, is undergoing a review of the implementation of the United Nations Convention on Corruption, which calls on states to criminalize corrupt conduct, prevent corruption, and enforce legislation on corruption. Speaking at the launch of the Anti-Corruption and Transparency Week in Accra, Minister for Planning, Professor George Jan Bafo, says Ghana is expected to report on SDG Goal 16.5, which requires the country to substantially reduce corruption in all forms. He added, Government is strengthening anti-corruption institutions to enable them address corruption. Let's speak now to our reporter, Ifa evans -Jinri. Now, Ifa, what kind of measures are government putting in place to strengthen anti-corruption institutions in Ghana? Some of these measures, um, Daniel, are um, allocating more resources to Shraj. Um, you know, it's an institution that investigates uh, complaints of violations of fundamental rights and freedoms and uh, injustice and also corruption. Now, apart from this, uh, government is reconstructing a modern office block uh, for this same institution, Shraj, to replace the offices that the 2013 FAR destroyed. The Office of the Special Prosecutor is also receiving the needed attention. Now, 180 million Ghana cities is at the disposal. That is uh, the Office of the Special Prosecutor in, in 2019. And efforts are currently on to adopt the necessary support and legislation to enable the cost. And, and then government is also enforcing the public procurement laws to ensure value for money and curtail sole sourcing. So, Daniel, these are uh, just a few of the many things government plans to do to deal with corruption in the country. Let me also mention that the Shraj Commissioner, Joseph Wittel, expressed disappointment with agencies and partners who he claimed uh, uh, did not show any interest in the implementation of the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan. He says uh, this all adds up to the fact that we have a long way to go in the fight against corruption. Now, if our one major uh, leg in the fight against corruption is the passage of a rights to information bill, uh, was any mention made of that legislation? Well, uh, no, that, that didn't come up. He, he, the, the, the Professor Jan Bafu, who spoke on behalf of Vice President Baumi, only outlined some of the measures they, they are putting in place to ensure that corruption dealt with effectively in the country. Thank you, Ifwa evans um for that update from there. Now, call him controversial and he won't mind. Gado, as he's popularly called, agrees his cartoons sometimes hit harder than should be. The Tanzanian-born cartoonist who operates largely in Eastern and Central Africa has for years been at the forefront of the fight against corruption through satire. Joy News' is Joseph Akable caught up with Gado on the sidelines of an African Union high-level dialogue on corruption. He's calling for a collaboration among anti-corruption crusaders on the continent. Typical Gado cartoon, pretty much controversial. In this piece of work, Gado portrays Kenyan president Uhuru Kenyatta as someone who is power drunk. This work is one of many works of Gado that hit hard at Kenya's first gentleman. This will land him in trouble in March 2016 when his employer's nation media group sacked him. In the popular cartoon published in the East African newspaper, Gado depicted Tanzanian President Kikwete caricatured half-nude eating grapes from the hand of one of seven well-endowed ladies. Each of the ladies represented seven weaknesses in Jakaya's government, chronism, incompetence, among others. Born Godfrey in Wapembwa, Gado has for more than two decades operated largely in East and Central Africa.
I caught up with him on the sidelines of an African Union high-level dialogue on corruption. So I've been working for a long time. Uh, I did uh, start working in, uh, uh, professionally uh, from 1992. And uh, I, um, uh, I suppose as, a, as, a, as a, an artist from school, I used to, uh, as, a, as a talented boy, I used to draw all the time. But uh, I, uh, I did um, join the, the, the Daily Nation from 1992. Um, and uh, since then, I've been uh, working as a, a political cart cartoonist, but also I've gone on to become a, a, an animator and, and um, a TV producer uh, and uh, a satirical writer. Um, so, oh, but I've continued doing editorial cartoons um, um, uh, uh, throughout my career. I've looked at a few of your works and I realize that, I mean, they are a bit pretty much controversial sometimes. Yeah. Uh, you, you, I hear you've landed in trouble a few times. Yeah. Tell me about it. Uh, well, I've, I've gotten into trouble uh, quite a, a, a number of times, a lot of times, I must say. Uh, but that's also the nature of um, um, satire and it's the nature of uh, editorial cartooning. Uh, it's a controversial um, art form. Uh, it's confrontational. Uh, it uh, speaks truth to power, and uh, authority, don't, you know, uh, doesn't like that. And, and so, you should be prepared to uh, face challenges here and there. You should be prepared to face um, uh, threats here and there. Uh, I've been very happy. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to say that uh, over the course of the years, I've, I've been, uh, you know, lucky to work with. Um, a uh, very um, um, fairly independent uh, organizations, uh, you know, so they gave me a platform to work very independently, I must say, which is not easy uh, to get in Africa. It's not, uh, you don't have as many media houses that would give a satirist that kind of platform. And so I, I, I remain humble because I understand that, that, um, that fact. Uh, and, and so I also, Fair, fair, fair enough, I, I, I do uh, uh, recognize um, uh, that uh, comes with responsibility. I was watching one of your work, I mean, it was actually shown uh, during your interaction, the panel discussion, and it showed exploitation, yeah. how um, some oil company were exploiting the people. Yeah. Uh, that, more often than not, are you the cartoonist actually saying what is actually the case, or you are mixing stuff up? No, I think uh, satire um, can um, point out to um, about ills rather in the society, uh, but satire on its own uh, it has its own limitations. So yes, uh, satire uh, uh, looks at. Uh, different areas continue to raise uh, consciousness uh, amongst the people and all these things can only be done uh, in collaborations uh, all these things can be done if we cooperate if we work together so it is it's it, it, it I, I'm, um, I, I'm very much aware of that um, and and uh, um, I, I, I don't take a position that you know satire alone can solve all these problems as the watching join news today with me, Daniel Dazi. Up next is business with Odilia Ntiamwa.